And then start considering what you really want to do with your finite time on this planet. Hint, it's probably not becoming the most efficient employee ever to design a color-coded spreadsheet call me out. He has just said the same thing over and over again for 150 pages now. A nonfiction is about to make me cry. These two women are both Geminis. She was too impatient to learn how to play an instrument and wanted to be good at everything she tried the first time, which I, I relate to. Hello friends, I'm Kayla. I'm no stranger to silly little astrology based books, but I'd never seen one before fully dedicated to recommending books within it until a friend of the channel, Abby, messaged me back in November. She shared this book with me called Reading the Stars. It's from Book Riot, one of my go-to places for book recommendations. So literally that day, I went out and purchased myself a copy. It would have been exactly three years ago that I did this Aries related video where I went to various websites and got custom book recommendations for my sign. Uh, I thought I would post this on my birthday so I could fully embrace Aries season, but three years later, we're going to embark on all of the book recommendations in here. First up, the day that I purchased this, I did film a reaction to the book recommendations because I couldn't wait. So let's head over to like the five minute clip of that. It's called Reading the Stars, Astrology for Book Lovers. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful size. It feels good. It's full of like full color images and it's just really stunning. My page, Look how beautiful that is. So I'm gonna read through all of the Aries reading life, reading for growth, my literary soulmate, famous authors, and then there's recommendations. As we know, I have a competitive spirit, a quick temper, and a habit of jumping into action. Aries are just so excited and happy to be here. That's really real. Mm, they'll rarely let you win an argument. Well, they love stories with a competitive edge or with an underdog protagonist who fights their way to the top. I do think that's true, which is why I see the Hunger Games recommended every time Aries shows up on any list ever. In the bookish world, you're most likely to find Aries door busting a library sale. So true. And promoting their bookstagram. So true. They see reading as a social hobby and love book clubs. Oh my God, I run a book club. Aries can be sore losers. So books about losing gracefully or turning failure into learning moments are great personal development books. I, I get that. Okay, let's move into the recommendations. I just saw the first one. It's War Cross by Marie Lu. This was a four star for me. Uh, so we can already consider these recommendations a win. I don't think I've ever met a video game book that I didn't like. Ready Player One, Slay. This is so high, I really think I need to pick up Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Next we have something called, is that Haiku? Haiku? A series by Haruchi Frudate, translated by Adrian Beck. Oh, it's manga? No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, it's sports manga. That's interesting. It's about a high school volleyball team. I did play volleyball in high school. I still love myself some volleyball. The next is called The Regional Office is Under Attack by Manuel Gonzalez. I've never heard of it. It's about a super powered female assassin team. Okay, next one is How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy by Jenny Odell. <laughs> I feel called out. Okay, next is this, oh gosh, Radical Acceptance, Embracing Your Life with the Heart of a Buddha by Tara Brosh. What's next? Dead Dead Girls by Nikesa Afia, 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals by Oliver Berkman. There are too many non-fictions in this list. Aerie seems to always be going at top speed, so it's worth taking a moment to recognize that no matter how good you are or how competitive you become, you can't do it all. Start considering what you really want to do with your finite time on this planet. Hint, it's probably not becoming the most efficient employee ever to design a color-coded spreadsheet. Call me out. There's a couple other recommendations. Binti by Nnedi Okorafor. I do want to read that. Dumplin' by Julie Murphy. Mm, how to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe by Charles Yu. What is that? The Girls I've Been by Tess Sharp. That was on my TBR. And The Year of the Witching by Alexis Henderson. Oh my God. I love that book. Five stars. In fact, I never shut up about this book. I'm very intrigued with this recommendation list and I'm sure it would be very good for my own personal growth and reading. So I'll do it. And I've now secured everything that was mentioned except for I think one book. Uh, like I said, I've already read and enjoyed these two. And some of these look a little different than I was expecting. What I will say so far, my impressions are, I enjoy that this didn't feel targeted to any specific gender 
or age range, it felt like a pretty well curated diverse list of books. From author identity to genre itself, there is such an interesting range of things here. So we've got some nonfiction here. I love these two covers. They're both really interesting and I'm more intrigued than I thought because I'm an Aries and I don't like being told what to do so maybe I steer away from nonfiction sometimes. Uh, and then this one is just interesting. I still haven't looked at any of the other sections so I don't know what the genres look like within those. So is it that Aries specifically enjoy sci-fi? Because there's a lot of it here. I can't say that the covers of these ones appeal to me very much. We'll see. We've got one mystery to explore, one manga, and one contemporary. Of course, if you don't want to pick this up, Book Riot actually does frequent like monthly zodiac sign centric recommendations. So I'll link their like website down below. And at the end of this experiment, there's going to be a spin-off vlog for channel members where after I've read some nonfiction targeted at me, I'm going to actually talk through what I consider some of my flaws and strengths and pick a book recommended to a different sign. Maybe it ends up being my moon sign, my rising sign, and read something that I've actually selected for myself that I think would benefit me in a certain way. But without further ado, let's get into the vlog. So of the three nonfictions that I have here, these two seem to me the most focused on self-improvement um, from things like work-life balance to comparing yourself to others to perfectionism, self-doubt, time management, things that I wouldn't feel compelled to pick up a book or feel like I need help with those specific things. Meanwhile, with How to Do Nothing, this pitches it as this isn't a self-help book, despite the title, or an instructional guide. Instead, it's a deeply researched exploration of what is lost when our attention is constantly being pulled in a thousand directions at once, especially on social media. So again, while I don't think this is something that I personally struggle with, I think that since I already agree, like, with I think what the book is saying, I think it'll be an enjoyable experience to read. I think I'm most interested to hear what her opinion of nothing means like doing nothing. So it's organized in six different chapters. I'll check in with you after the first three. Okay, so her take on doing nothing just means that she says the first half of this book, she's going to talk about the importance of not doing things that aren't serving you, that don't matter. Um, and the second half is how to make change with the time that you now have that's free. But it really isn't like actionable steps. It's just like paragraph after paragraph about like various anecdotes and histories and stories and the importance of all of these things. It's not how to do stuff, it's the importance of them. And the main goal of this I think is political resistance. Um, she kicks off multiple chapters with talking about Trump's America. As a Canadian there's things that apply still, um, but I think the biggest focus of this is she wants us to do nothing from the point of view of capitalist productivity. So the first section, um, she talked about things like the importance of taking care of your neighbors and going outside more and finding a community and doing things that doesn't support like purchasing stuff. She talked about active listening and supporting public spaces like libraries and parks, the importance of just connecting with the earth, which I, you know, picking this up, don't see as doing nothing. Like I do nothing all the time. I, I go outside, I spend time in nature, we go hiking, we go to parks, we go swimming, we connect with nature all the time. We connect with our community, help out neighbors. The second section she talked about communes and monks a lot. Again, a lot of references, a lot of stories, um, the importance of these like initiatives, but also flaws within them. Um, the internet's goal of making money and using sensational headlines. And like, I agree, that is things that bother me, how people get so easily sucked into getting angry on the internet, easily being misled by the internet. And then the third chapter was about collective refusal. It was about like strikes and bargaining, but again, anecdotes. So I don't really know who I would recommend this to because it's not, it's definitely not teaching me anything. So part of me wants to say like, if I had read this 10 years ago, maybe it would have done something, but I don't think like, because it's not 
giving an explanation or a definition of what bargaining is so like if this was introducing you to what a strike was I don't think it would it, it's doing that she talked about the importance of recognizing hustle culture and the thing that I say all the time which is like the people who are always like if you're not exhausted at the end of the day you're not doing enough that that's mind-boggling like that is so toxic to see people getting wrapped up in comparing themselves to other people and doing all this stuff but at the same time it's like you might be viewing hustle culture as just some people literally needing to survive like some people have three jobs out of necessity it's not because they you know want to move up just for personal gain like it is a financial necessity but she is doing a great job of recognizing that she's talking about privilege she's saying like yeah the reason I can go sit in a park and enjoy the birds for an hour is because I am in this position I have this type of job etc I think think that I agree with so many things that she's saying. I just don't think that this is packaged in a way that I can enjoy it. All right, I have finished How to Do Nothing. Let's see. Chapter four talked about consciousness and perspective and human capacity for attention. Um, a lot of studies about like distraction, urgency of notifications, and like the whole interface design of apps, which is something that um, apps and your phone like which is something that bothers me so much is I talk to my husband all the time about this how the same like importance shouldn't be given to a text from your work as well as like a notification from TikTok that somebody liked your comment like those should not be held at the same importance but the way that notifications are set up and designed, they feel like they hold the same importance. So it's so easy to get distracted by your phone and to feel like you have to respond to things so quickly. Um, that's why my phone is on do not disturb 24 seven. <laughs> I think there definitely needs to be more intention put into how we use technology when we use technology, um, the moments that you actually put forth towards it. Like I know my mental health is so much better when I place a specific amount of time or a point in the day when I use technology. This chapter also talked about bioregionism and it really lost me. She says things like, I'd never thought before where rain came from. Or, you know, she's out feeding the birds and she's talking about how she might view herself as like a brand, but the birds just see her as her authentic self and not her productivity. And then she's just sharing about like grocery stores and how when you go to the grocery store, you see everyone there as a barrier um, and someone that you're angry at for being the reason why it's taking you so long to get your groceries and you just want to get home to your dinner. And so all of those moments will turn into a kind of teaching lesson. Not really, more for herself. She says things like, um, I realized that the creek, like nobody made it. It it's just exists in nature. And the creek is how I know that this all isn't a simulation. When she switches her perspective at the grocery store, she said, if you really learned to think and pay attention, this event is sacred. On fire with the same force that lit the stars. And I just, it was a, I don't know. There was certain phrasing that I just uh, couldn't relate to in any way. Some of her implications just didn't land for me. Since I didn't have any takeaway lessons necessarily and didn't appreciate the writing in any specific way, um, I'm gonna not rate this one. Apologies if I'm lacking coherency a bit in this video. Uh, if you couldn't tell by the day quill I accidentally left in the shot of the last clip, I'm not feeling at my best right now. But it's a new day, we're moving on, and I just DNF'd my first book of the video. Hopefully my only book for the video, but I started in on The Regional Office is Under Attack by Manuel Gonzalez. I got 50 pages in, I gave it a good effort, and the writing style is just not for me. There's something about the narrative voice that isn't my favorite, and since the plot wasn't already something that intrigued me, it was kind of easy to ditch it. But the reason that this was selected for me is it says it's part superhero movie, part spy story, and all action. I don't really like high action most of the time and I don't like superhero stories and I don't really like spy stories. <laughs> so this is about a super powered team of assassins. And like, I think the idea is cool that, you know, I like the ideas of justice and supporting your community and having powers and like doing good things with it. But I often just find superhero stories not my taste. It felt like a mix of hench meets kick-ass 
meets Die Hard. And maybe that's a trio that sounds really intriguing to you. For me, it just, it, it wasn't, it just wasn't for me. But it's okay because another sci-fi on the list is working for me. I'm halfway through this one, How to Safely Live in a Science Fictional Universe by Charles Yu. And Charles Yu is the main character in the book. And Charles Yu, the character in the book, is writing the book, How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe, inside the book. So I love it already. This one was just on that list at the back, so I, there's no specific reason why this was selected for me. But it's reminding me of a mix right now of Matt Haig and A.S. King. I like time travel, I like portals, and we've got all of that in here. So this man or his father essentially uh, discovered time travel and he's now living in a little pocket of time and has a job to do every day and it's just his kind of mundane existence but at the same time he's trying to find his father because he has been kind of abandoned and I just get the feeling like why I reference those other authors is it's fantastical it's kind of surreal but it's saying more important real life stuff so I think I don't know right now but it feels like it could be a metaphor for, you know, human connection and even depression. We've got that classic scenario of him being stuck in a time loop because he has encountered himself. It's been really fun to read. There are moments like this where you're getting to read the actual book, how to live safely, blah, 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 blah. And it's just a tiny excerpt and it gives you insight into what just happened or what's about to happen. So he discovers this book and he's trying to follow its suggestions but a lot of it is also blank because he hasn't technically written it yet and so he has to write it while coming into contact with himself. It's super fast paced and a quick read and I'm having a nice time. All right I ended up quite enjoying this. I think my final rating is going to be like a 3.75. It seems like a pretty easy recommend to me. It having an average to low Goodreads rating of 3.45 feels to me like everyone is giving it a three and a four. Like everyone can acknowledge it said interesting things. It's a little experimental. It's fun to read. That's why the rating is perfectly in the middle of those two things. Sometimes a book has that average rating because everybody gives it a five and a one. This doesn't seem to me like something that would evoke really passionate feelings from either side. Like this is no one's favorite book. This is no one's least favorite book. It feels really meta naturally, which is fun. And I like all the things it had to say about like relationships within your family family and the things that he was working for and fighting for. My favorite thing about science fiction is when characters are explaining how everything works and I'm completely on board. Like there's a certain way that an author can handle it and can just do it so well and it existed in here when they were talking about how all of these things work like they don't make any sense but I was like yeah oh my gosh I totally know exactly what you're saying even though it's not in the realm of reality. I think the way it explained time travel is really interesting so I don't know if this would be considered a spoiler. It's not a plot spoiler, but it's a conceptual spoiler. So if you really want to read this and you don't want to know anything, come back in just a second. But the way that time travel works in here is it's not like humanity created time travel. And it's more like it's mental. So it's that evolution has gotten us to a place that we have to focus only on the here and now because we're in such danger or whatever it is that we can only see the present day. And so it's like an ability that you can develop solely mentally in order to time travel and just find a way to do it. So it's like his father discovers it and a lot of the story is childhood reflections and vignettes and he's talking about how his dad is like constantly five minutes behind everyone. So he's sharing a fact and they're learning about it and then they go to talk to him and connect with him and he's gone already because he's always five minutes behind. And I just feel like that is such a good metaphor for losing connection with your family. And since his dad is so lonely and is developing all these things as kind of a scientist but isn't being taken seriously and there's a lot of stuff about like immigration and opportunities I feel like it was all tied together and really easy to see the references that are being made and how his depression is what's making him not a part of the family and not connected but it is like literally the time travel that's doing it. I don't read enough sci-fi to know if that is uh, done topic already but I just found it so interesting in the explanations. I had a good time with this so that's that. Who knows what I'm going to read next. 
it's officially spring it's officially Aries season I'll be honest I don't think I've worn this shirt a single time since the last Aries video uh, where I bought this so it might be time to retire but I thought I'd wear it one more time today is a murder mystery day I'll be reading dead dead girls by Nikessa Afia and this is a Harlem Renaissance murder mystery don't know why this one was recommended to me but the point that I'm at right now I just finished chapter 17 so what is that a third of the way in I'm getting the feeling that our main character Louise is maybe an Aries because it just said she was too impatient to learn how to play an instrument and wanted to be good at everything she tried the first time which I I relate to in some ways so she's got twin sisters her family doesn't really seem to like her honestly very much. She works at a cafe during the day and a speakeasy in the evening and other black girls at the speakeasy are being murdered. Two happened right off the bat and she ended up like getting arrested. This is in the synopsis um, and she could have like stayed in jail or agreed to help this detective in finding out the truth finding the killer and so she agreed to do that so it's got the amateur sleuth vibes of a cozy mystery it's also got that typical setup of a cozy mystery that they sometimes do where the person has been through something like off page you know in their childhood or whatever so she experienced a kidnapping and, or she was kidnapped and now as an adult she leads a certain life and she's looking into these murders and wanting to support the girls who she works with protect herself and I wonder if the kidnapping is going to come into it. I wonder if these things are going to be connected. This is the first book in a series. I like the second cover more so I hope I like it and want to continue and I wonder like how the mystery like is the mystery continuing or is it a completely different thing that she's solving in this one like is she going to become a detective or is she still kind of this side person who the detective seems to I don't know it's hard to figure out their dynamic he doesn't really seem to like her or want to solve this mystery like he doesn't care that much about it but he's also getting annoyed with her because she keeps inserting herself into situations where like she has no idea what she's doing but obviously her kind of over-the-top personality and making mistakes is probably what's going to solve the mystery anyway that's how the amateur sleuth thing always works so I'm going to read maybe another third and I'll check in with you about Maybe I'll make a prediction about who the culprit is. All right, it's dinner time. And today, what have I been up to? Liam and I hung out, we went for a nice long walk. We went to a coffee shop and did lunch and hot chocolate. And it was a really nice day. He's now on spring break, so we have to find activities for him. He's actually in a hockey camp every single evening this week and then probably a baseball camp next week. At the grocery store, I grabbed this, which is like an already prepped um, potato and carrot thing which I'm really excited about so I don't have to marinate my own vegetables and I want to see if this is good. They're called smashums and it says to squish them while they're in the pack which is perfectly easy and then you just put it on like a baking sheet so I'll report back and let you know if they're good. I don't go to the grocery store like I don't do the grocery shopping in our family um, probably because I buy stuff like this and I can't even tell you how much this was like I'll just grab whatever so I don't know if these have been a thing for a long time but to me they're brand new as for the book I've gotten a hundred more pages in I feel like naturally with a mystery it kind of slows down in the middle third this one is no exception but it is taking a different route to a lot of mystery books as in it's not just a linear story where you are getting all of these clues and then you find out what happens. Um, there's like a side thing that just happened that is changing the trajectory of the mystery itself. And our main character is kind of on her own now trying to figure out what's going on. There hasn't been a lot of plot. It's just been her talking to a lot of people, kind of interviewing people, walking around meeting a lot of people. I do have two culprits in mind so I'm interested to know if it's one of those books where you have a list of people that are suspects and it's going to be one of them or if it's going to be somebody we haven't even met yet or somebody out of left field. I'm obviously not going to tell you which one it is by the end but I will update you um, when I'm eating my potatoes and I'll give you my final review. I finished the book, I finished my dinner, I went back for seconds. Um, this was really good. I feel, <laughs> should I review this the way I'm reviewing my book? I think there should have been one more vegetable in here just because just to justify like buying a packaged 
dinner like that. Could have used onion for sure, but like the dill sauce is really good. Um, I put a little bit of ricotta and lemon. Feta and lemon would have been better, but I didn't have feta. Highly recommend. I think there should have been onion in there, but onion would be an easy thing to chop up and add, but like that would defeat the purpose. Like if I'm chopping up a bunch of vegetables, I would want to chop up a bunch of vegetables. As far as the book, I'm giving this a four. I think it was a really fun story to follow. It was exactly who I suspected, but the way we got there was good. I think the main thing for me is it could have been a little more atmospheric, but I really enjoyed the main character. The culprit made a lot of sense. Everything was easy to follow. Um, I definitely would not call this a cozy mystery, just in case somebody was planning on picking it up um, who only reads cozy mysteries. It had a lot of heavier topics, assault and racism and dealt with a lot of other things. I really wish of all the ones that didn't come with, I just realized this one did come with a description. I thought it was one of the ones in the back. Oh my gosh, I get to find out because I haven't read this section. Um, why do I think that this one was recommended? Probably because there's a sense of like vengeance. There's also some twists and turns. Like there was one storyline, um, one thing that happened I was not expecting. I didn't think the author would do. So it was surprising. Of all the murder mysteries out there, like I wonder, maybe it's because I get to solve it as I go. So it's like kind of a challenge, which maybe is why as an Aries, I like mysteries. Let's find out. The ram needs a hook to be pulled through a novel, which makes mysteries an excellent choice. Aries are sure to take it upon themselves to try to solve a whodunit before the answer is revealed. And that built-in challenge, <laughs> the built-in challenge will help keep their attention. And then it just gets into the plot of the story. Okay, so I don't know if this is a duology or a whole series, um, but I would continue, I think, which is fun. So that was a win. I am officially one third of the way into 4,000 weeks, time management for mortals by Oliver Berkman, and I really don't like it. I'm waiting for it to get good because it has a really high readership and a high rating on Goodreads, so I know it gets good, but this first, um, how many pages? A hundred pages was just him repeating the same thing over and over again. I feel like I'm still in the intro of the book. Basically his main thing so far, Liam's laughing at me. We're at Bulk Barn. Um, and so I thought I would take you in. Maybe I'll find bananas and then I can show a picture. I could take a picture of this with a bowl of um, banana candies. I heard the bulk barn isn't in other countries, so that makes me sad for everyone. His main thing in here so far has been productivity and how this book is for people like him who have spent their entire life trying to be more productive, try to get more done, try to get more success, try to get more money, try to find more time when there is no time and has read every productivity book on the market and this is to change your mind about all of that and stop seeing your life as productivity and efficiency. So again, I'm not the target audience of that, but I'm sure he's gonna touch on other things later. He just keeps saying that over and over again. Like no matter how many emails you answer, there's always more emails. No matter how much work you do, you're gonna get given more work. So just focus on what you can do and the time that you have and stop obsessing about getting things done. And, and that's it, he said it a lot. Since we're at you know what? I said in a re recent video we don't have a candy store. Bulk Barn kind of is a candy store if you really think about it. Since we are picking things out though, I thought we'd look at Sanctuary World and see what um, candy represents us because maybe this is what we need to pick up. For an Aries, it says that I'm supposed to like M&Ms and you're supposed to like bubble gum. Is that true? No. Yes, it is. No, it's not. You don't like M&Ms. Okay, next one. If I was a sport, I'd be hockey. That's a lot. You'd be bowling. <laughs> Why? If I was a vegetable, I'd be beets. Russell Sprouts, okay, that's fine, that's fine. Um, I'd be red hots. <laughs> Candy corn. I agree. Ooh, if I were pasta, I'd be elbow. Oh, I'm shells, okay, that's fine, that's fine. Ooh, if I were a snack, I'd be cheese puffs. Ice cream! I love cheese puffs. If I were a drink, I'd be straight espresso. I very much agree with that. I don't know what... Uh, That's what I, I get. I one. Ooh, I'd be Jolly Ranchers. M&M's. Okay, let's go see if we can find Jolly Ranchers, M&M's. We're only allowed to buy what represents us. So That's a lot. You're only allowed candy corn. Let's go. Candy haul. Say candy haul. Hi. I got those. Oh, and there's chocolate covered marshmallows, caramel sea salt things, chocolate covered caramel. Oh, and these? I haven't had these since I was a kid. 
They're like little crispy chocolate things. I'm gonna Jelly have one Ranchers! Of these. Oh, and I had to get Jelly Ranchers because that was the law. I just want one caramel see something. Okay. Marshmallow, marshmallow. What's in it? Is it just straight chocolate? It has a little like Rice Krispies in it. Uh, I mean, it's not good chocolate, but it's nostalgic. Mm. Is it as good as you thought it'd be? Nice. Ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> they do want to see the bite taken out. I think I'm gonna switch to the audiobook and at least that'll just get me through it because I'm struggling. I need to put away all the books that I took out to film. I need to reorganize my bookshelf. I'm really trying to just figure out if I'm not liking it because it's saying all the same things that the last book did. Like these are, these feel just like the same book. It's talking about all the same stuff, the attention economy, like literally using those words and talking about how people these days can't pay attention to things, which is funny because I keep thinking to myself, this should have been an Instagram infographic. This could have been a much shorter article, but like that's my fault for not wanting to read hundreds of pages to get the same message, I guess. But no, it is that he has just said the same thing over and over again for 150 pages now. And I know for a fact this is valuable for somebody. He's talking about living in the moment. He's talking about making your time worthwhile and figuring out what's actually important to you and doing that first because you can't get everything done, which is totally true and it makes sense. And I'm sure some people do need to hear that like, your time needs to be focused on things that you actually want to spend your time doing and how to prioritize what's important. But he is just saying that. He's just saying that over and over again. He just keeps saying like, you don't have time for everything, live in the moment. You don't have time for everything, do the important things first. He's also talking about um, commitment and avoidance a lot. And again, I'm sure it's things that people need to hear. He's talking about how it's so hard to commit to a relationship or a career path and how people spend their lives avoiding hard topics and hard conversations and making decisions. And again, like I just don't relate to that. And I'm starting to feel like there's something wrong with me because I don't relate to these things. He's like, everybody knows that when you are in pain, you try to think about something else to distract yourself. But he's talking about how important it is to confront the pain that you're in and live in the moment and really exist. And I'm like, I always do that. Is that like a weird thing that I do that? That when I go to the dentist, I'm sitting there and like I'm focused on the exact tooth that they're working on rather than like, I don't know, pinching myself or like trying to make my mind wander. Like when I gave birth, I didn't want any drugs or an epidural or anything because I don't, I, without thinking about it, maybe that's like how I wanted control over the situation. I wanted to feel like I was there, I was present. Not that there's anything wrong with not doing that. All these scenarios obviously apply to somebody and it's not me. I don't do all the things that he's talking about, romanticizing future events and not just thinking and then being disappointed when you've spent all of this time planning this event and then it could never live up to your expectations because you set your expectations way too high. And again, the same conversation, like you can't do everything, you can't succeed at everything. So he's saying like, stop focusing on your neighbor who's doing more than you. Stop trying to make more money because someone else is making more money. You will always want more. And all that's fine and relatable, obviously, to the people who've loved this. But I just feel like at the same time, even if I did connect to these things that he's saying, he's not actually giving advice. I really don't think he is. He's just saying, stop thinking about that thing. Stop getting distracted. Stop comparing yourself to others. And like, that could be an infographic. Here's a list of things to be happier. I don't want to be getting mad at this book. <laughs> so I'm just going to listen to the audiobook because I maybe it will turn into something and I will absolutely eat my words if it does. So just give me a minute. The more fruitful approach to the challenge of living more fully in the moment starts from noticing you are, in fact, always already living in the moment anyway, whether you like it or not. And if you're inescapably already in the moment, there's surely something deeply dubious about trying to bring that state of affairs about. To try to live in the moment implies that you're somehow separate from the moment and thus in a position to either succeed or fail at living it. Attempting to live in the moment to find meaning in life now brings its own challenges too, though. Have you ever actually tried it? Despite the insistence of modern mindfulness teachers that it's a speedy path to happiness, and despite a growing body of psychological research on the benefits of savoring or making a deliberate effort to appreciate life's smaller pleasures, it turns out to be bewilderingly difficult to do. In his hippie classic, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, Robert Pearson describes arriving with his young son beside the blazing blue expanse of Crater Lake in Oregon, a collapsed prehistoric volcano that is America's deepest body of water. He's determined to get the most out of the experience, yet somehow he fails. We push ourselves harder to get rid of anxiety, but the result is actually more anxiety, because the faster we go, the clearer it becomes we'll never succeed in getting ourselves or the rest of the world to move as fast as we feel is necessary. Meanwhile, we suffer the other effects of moving too fast. Yet the only thing that feels feasible as a way of managing all this additional anxiety is to move faster still. You know you must stop accelerating, yet it also feels as though you can't. This way of life isn't wholly unpleasant. 
Just as alcohol gives the alcohol a buzz, there's an intoxicating thrill to living in Warsaw. This sounds like the most exhausting life to be living. So I finished it. I obviously didn't like it, didn't gain anything from it, um, but I'm not gonna rate it. And that's not for lack of wanting to admit I hated it. Um, it's just, this like, again, wasn't meant for me. And while I read it with an open mind, I didn't read it authentically as someone who needed something to gain from it. And obviously all of you who think zodiac signs are silly, of which like, I belong more so than not, you'll tell me I didn't get anything from it probably because I don't actually align with all of the things that my sign necessarily does. Aries seem to always be going at top speed. This book is a reminder to focus on priorities instead of trying to become more and more productive. See, like that's the lesson right there. Stop thinking you can do everything. But I would recommend if you're already interested in this, pick it up, there's no reason not to. If you are somewhat interested, kind of on the fence, what I would say is go to the back there are five questions in here. One of them is, are you holding yourself to and judging yourself by standards of productivity or performance that are impossible to meet? Another question, how would you spend your days differently if you didn't care so much about seeing your actions reach fruition? And those are not mo like journal moments. I mean, I mean, they are, but in here they are answered. So read all the questions. If you read the answers to those and feel like you need more than just what the questions answers say, then read the book. It's not that it's not valuable, and it's not that, again, I disagree with anything in it. Oh, that's that. The next book's gonna be better. It's a new day and a new chance to match my book cover with my clothing. Somebody on Instagram asked me about this again. They're like, how do you, how do these books not fall out of your bookshelf? I don't know. My bookshelf's just really tight. Like, I can slide this in. It'll stay here forever. And like, it's handy because I don't have to hold the book now when I want to talk about it. I'm currently reading Binti. I'm just at the beginning. This is the first book in a novella series. And I highlighted with a marker instead of a highlighter by kind of accident. Didn't realize how dark it would be. But this part, we're only 23 pages in, but I feel like the hook is just so intriguing. So Binti gets on this like spaceship. She's from Earth and she's traveling to this university that she gets invited to. And right off the bat, she's being judged a lot. People are like holding their nose and staring her down because she looks different than a lot of the people who are attending this university. The Himba people, the tribe in which she belongs, puts clay in their hair on their bodies. It is so stunning in real life. And people aren't used to it. They're judging her, questioning her. And I just think that's something really interesting about Afrofuturism is a lot of times I think maybe it's just like the limited scope of sci-fi that I have but a lot of it is often about uh conformity or when you see a lot of futuristic stuff like everybody's wearing gray like button-up shirts and everybody's like marching in a line and everybody's like doing the same thing and it's very um, robotic. That's just how I see a lot of futuristic stories to look, movies and films and books. That's how it always has been to me, at least the ones that I've consumed. And Afrofuturism just so boldly lets the culture be so much of the story and there are so many like diverse things in these futuristic ideas. I know um, and Jerry from Onyx Pages has this reference video that I've bookmarked all the books in it about like nonfiction related to Afrofuturism so you can understand it better and I need to pick some of those up because I think I originally heard of this because of that creator originally years and years ago. Um, so the hook is they all get on the ship, they're initially reacting to each other, engaging with each other, kind of making friends and connections. And she is talking about somebody she met and says, I never got to tell, I never got a chance to tell him that my hair was braided into the history of my people because what happened happened. It occurred on the 18th day of the journey. And it's just this ominous foreshadowing that's like, why did you never get to talk to him about something? Like what happened? Something obviously happens on the ship. So only 24 pages in, but that is technically like almost a third of the story and I already have a good feeling about this. We are not going anywhere today. Liam requested we stay home. He's playing games today. He just got some kind of new game and um, I just got him the new Spy Family while we were out at the bookstore. And I'm gonna try to read, since we're just gonna be home, three books today. This one, this one, and at least start on this one, though the spacing is rather large and there's a lot of emails and texts or something. So this will be a pretty quick read, I imagine. I have a lot of work to do, so I might pick up the audiobook of this, but let's focus on Binti. 
This was exactly what I needed and exactly what the video needed. Just a real win. Uh, five star novella. I'm so excited to continue in the trilogy. I feel like this was a simple enough setup that I could recommend this to any age range, but it's not too simplistic that it's not obviously intended or can be enjoyed by adults. And it's interesting because this is just as action packed as like other books that I've DNF'd in this video, but I can't explain why this one just worked for me. Maybe it was the initial setup, the description of everything, how deep like things felt and just the writing style in general felt really familiar though I don't think I've read from this author before. It was just really easy to get into and I like books that involve stuff about language and communication and there were some interesting like technology concepts that had to do with that that was really interesting to read. There was humans and non-humans in here and the descriptions of things were just fascinating to read. I love getting dropped into a science fiction situation and just having things described to me and just learning and feeling like I got inside this author's brain and the ideas that she has. I could never come up with anything like this. I wouldn't say it ends on like a cliffhanger, but I am definitely intrigued what's going to happen in future books because after the flight itself, like stuff has to go on. I'm actually surprised this is only a trilogy. I just looked it up and found that out. I thought it was gonna be about like her attending this school and stuff, but because of the events on the ship and how the author really went there and made people go through stuff, uh, I don't even know what the overall arc of these three books is gonna be. I'm feeling re-energized and we can move on to something I probably am not gonna like, but I do just really wanna complete the list just to get ahead of the comments like I know this is now what people think is where I should start with manga or they would recommend other things. I already know manga and graphic novels are not for me. I'm not going to start reading them now. We are a manga household. It is everywhere around me. I'm familiar with it all. I'm not gonna start reading it but I am gonna read this because it was on the list and I like volleyball. <laughs> Well, the day has taken a turn. I am really dizzy <laughs> trying to figure out what has caused it because Liam also is really dizzy. Um, we both had sourdough grilled cheese and I realized afterwards it was a couple days past its best before date and like I can't imagine that would be it. That's the only thing I can really think of. I can't look at this. Like I literally am feeling nauseous. <laughs> So I've just been listening to the audiobook of the girls I've been just lying here, relaxing, staring at the ceiling. I also had to take down my twinkly lights because I went to change the battery and the batteries were wet inside. So today's just not my day. I got out this far into Haikyuu and I don't think I, I like it enough to continue um, another day. So I think this dizzy spell is just my sign to DNF it because I was struggling to get through it anyway. I don't really know the plot yet but Liam has actually read the entire series. His school library has it apparently so he likes it and now I have a little insight into something that he enjoyed but I am DNFing another book in this video and <laughs> I almost want to DNF this one too. No it is fine. I just don't know that I'm gonna get anything out of it I guess. So we've got this girl named Nora and the whole book I didn't realize I, it was on my TBR and I took it off my TBR when I started veering away from YA in the last couple years and I've read from Tess Sharp once before and gave it four stars but I don't remember like anything about this book which is weird. So in this one Nora is the daughter of like a con artist. She spent her life taking on different identities, being different girls, um, stealing from people, watching her mother get married to these men and then ruining the men's lives and then she just like runs away with her mother. So her mother has put her into a lot of terrible situations. She's gone through awful things but at the beginning of the book and the plot of this is she is uh, held hostage in a bank robbery. So it's her and a couple other teens and then there's other people in the bank. There's like a child there, there's some older people, whatever. Um, and a couple men come in and they hold they hold the bank up. It's not funny. Sorry. It's very intense. And Nora, because of the way she's been brought up and the way her mind works and her survival instincts, she is trying to find a way out of this for everyone involved. So we are in the bank and then I just started part two and it said the next 72 minutes. So it's kind of like each section is an hour or so of time and what happens in it. But then there's also moments in between 
some of the pages are different colors so i wonder if those are the flashbacks i'm guessing but we are getting um moments from her life so like when she gets involved with her girlfriend the breakup with her boyfriend um different situations with her mom and the two storylines are reflecting each other so it's like she admits something to her girlfriend and then we flash back and see what went down in that type of scenario. I think it's going to be a good book. It's saying important things already. I like Tess Sharp because she writes grittier YA for sure, but I guess it's that I don't feel super motivated to read it. As interesting and fast paced as it is, I'm kind of just like, okay, it's going to be like good by the end, but am I going to have any really big takeaways? I don't know. Final day of the vlog, I think. Everything should be wrapped up today and I couldn't have had a more beautiful day for it to be. The sun is shining more than ever. It's what I really needed. I went for a walk. I finished the audiobook of this um, while the boys went on their last probably snowboard day of the season. They're on their way home now and then we're gonna do dinner. It's like the first day I've had my windows open all day and just had the breeze come in and, and not feel too cold. This was probably a little intense for the beautiful scenery that I was experiencing because it got really intense and fast paced and dark. Not that it wasn't that whole time, but we ended up focusing so much more on the backstory than the current situation and hostage scenario than I guess I was expecting. But we needed all of that backstory to build the actual narrative itself and why our main character ended up in this situation and all the horrific things that have happened to her. And we needed to see all of that for her to grow and become her own person and not all of the girls that she has been that her mother abused her into being. This one again was just in the back, so I don't know why specifically, but I can imagine based on the other recommendations and reasons given for them, like Aries wants to be glued to the page, definitely did that. For Haikyuu, it says that the main character is forced to work with a teammate with exceptional skills, but a short temper, which is something that Ram is sure to sympathize with. And I feel like there's related things in here. I would say the high rating on Goodreads is absolutely justified here. I'm giving it a 3.5 just because this isn't typically a story that I'm currently interested in. If I had read this five years ago, I know I would have enjoyed it more. Anyone actively reading YA and th who thinks they'll be interested in this, I'm, I think it'll deliver everything that you're looking for. And now we're moving on to the last one, Radical Acceptance. I think the one that I'm judging the most for like, cover appeal and general pitch is probably gonna end up being my favorite because that's just how the cookie crumbles, you know? I'm gonna read the first 50 pages and then check in with you with my first impressions. A nonfiction is about to make me cry and not in a good way. I am so just seeped in other people's sadness and it's putting me in a terrible mood. I feel like what... <laughs> in such a good mood. <laughs> what self-improvement needs to do is it has to set up the audience that the book is for at the beginning. So it needs the author to tell a story about the worst place that they've ever been so they can share how they got out of it or share anecdotes from other people. So Tara Brack is a therapist, psychologist. So she's sharing experiences from her clients, the worst things that they've felt about themselves and how she helped them with these feelings. So obviously it's necessary, but like it's putting me in the opposite state that I'm supposed to be feeling. And I'm sure I'll get there, right? Like it will turn into something positive, but it has to set up just so much inner turmoil first. The very first paragraph She's saying, I was continually harassed by an inner judge who was merciless, relentless, nitpicking, driving, often invisible, but always on the job. My guiding assumption was something is fundamentally wrong with me. And I struggled to control and fix what felt like a basically flawed self. Internally, I was anxious, often depressed, Feeling not okay went hand in hand with deep loneliness. When I felt bad about myself, the walls got so thick it seemed others must be able to see them. Imprisoned within, I felt hollow and achingly alone. For so many of us, feelings of deficiency are right around the corner. It doesn't take much. Just hearing of someone else's accomplishments, being criticized, getting into an argument, making a mistake at work to make us feel 
that we are not okay. Because our habits of feeling insufficient are so strong, awaking from the trance involves not only inner resolve, but also an active training of the heart and mind. We can free ourselves from the suffering of trance by learning to recognize what is true in the present moment and by embracing whatever we see with an open heart. It's another book about living in the moment and self-hatred. The trance of unworthiness intensifies when our lives feel painful and out of control. We may assume that our physical sickness or emotional depression is our own fault, the result of our bad genes or our lack of discipline and willpower. We may feel that the loss of a job or a painful divorce is a reflection of our personal flaws. If we had only done better, if we were somehow different, things would have gone right. While we might place the blame on someone else, we still tactically blame ourselves for getting into the situation in the first place. It's been 50 pages of me just being so sad for other people. Like, I'm so sad that people feel so sad. <laughs> and I know that the Zodiac book was not recommending like I read all three of these back to back or even read three of them, all three of them in general. So it's nobody's fault I got myself in this situation except me. Oh no, the self-hatred is here. I also just realized this has snow on it and the snow is gone. So catch me buying new couch cushions in my next vlog. <laughs> just kidding. No, I'm not. Ooh, look how pretty. This is the most beautiful my little mountain meditation has been in a while. It might have taken me all day, but I finished it. Should I have finished it? Probably not. I wanted to not update you and give it my full undivided attention, really with an open mind, um, give in to all the things that she was saying. But yeah, no, I didn't like it. In my opinion, the way that this was told was 90% client experiences, her um, relationship with clients, the ways that she helped them. And because of that, it felt like testimonials it felt like she was trying to convince you to become a client of hers. Or if it, if, if it wasn't for potential clients, it felt almost like it was written for other professionals and how to help clients because it got really dark. Like it went into so many people's personal experiences and stories and I think it's really brave and bold and vulnerable for these clients to obviously have approved her to put their stories in here. But honestly, it just felt like kind of a weird book to read because unless you were in the exact same scenarios as these people who have the exact same dynamic with their husbands and then their husband went and cheated on them and you feel a lot of resentment towards yourself for that, or if you relate to one of her clients who horrifically went through childhood abuse um, and got really detailed about it. I don't know that the the things that she brought those clients, the ways that she helped them heal, the scenarios that they came up with together about, I don't know, like a fairy appearing to you as a child and telling you a story, or the way she had one person like internally go inside their body mentally and talk to their pain, or if you suddenly become more patient and calm in conversations, your alcoholic husband might stop drinking. Obviously that wasn't the goal that the reader would feel like they have the exact same scenario going on and they can grow from it but and it was more like general advice but all the advice was just really simplistic I find. Though this one did have more actionable steps than anything else it gave examples of meditation but kind of just was like meditate just try meditating think about this just like think about your body stop thinking about the world around you here's how to be the perfect meditator. So like, yeah, you got me. Meditation and mindfulness are practices that won't come easily to the impulsive Aries. <laughs> Interestingly, a lot of this was focused on outward opinions. Everybody who was self-doubting themselves and having self-hatred, questioning their place in life, wanting more, feeling shame and inadequacies, it was mostly rooted in other people viewing them, wanting to be seen a certain way, wanting people to perceive you a certain way, just caring a lot about outward appearance. Very 
air sign. It got me thinking, I wonder if these were written by an Aries? Like fiction aside, I talked about this in my last Zodiac video, I think a lot of times like recommendations for signs are about the main character. The main character is often aligning with the sign that the book's being recommended for. But with nonfiction, I feel like maybe it would be more impactful if it was written by an Aries because then maybe there'd be more of a connection because these two women are both Geminis, which is very interesting. In fact, I'm pretty sure with my internet sleuthing, they actually share a birthday. And then this is a Virgo author. I don't think anything in here specifically bothered me. Well, at the end of the day, zodiac sign recommendations are something silly and just for fun. It's not like Enneagram stuff that takes into account your personality, how you were raised, how you see the world, and like you fill out a questionnaire, it assigns you a number, and then you can get direct recommendations like all Aries obviously aren't the same. And while I do relate with many Aries identifiers, perhaps especially the nonfiction just connected to a part of me that I don't feel the closest to. So I read those three, I DNF'd these two. These ones were all good. And I finally got to read Binti, which was great. And let me end it with the Aries memes that I feel connected to the most. This one, this says 20% loves to correct others, 80% hates being told what to do, because that's real. Struggling to hold 17 items at the grocery store because baskets are for gatherers and I was born a hunter. I really feel that, I've been in that scenario plenty of times. Zodiac signs as readers is interesting because it says will splurge on aesthetic covers, which I don't know, I, I will go out of my way to find one, but I don't know if that I would pay a significant amount more for a cover I prefer. And loves a good short story collection, which I very much identify with and feel like that could have been a part of um, the list of recommended books. My phone is now shutting down for reasons unbeknownst to me. I know I had one that had four personality traits and I feel all of that. Of all the Stranger Things characters, I got Eddie Munson and I really connect with most of this. Oh, and then I know I saw one about um, the speed in which we get angry, but I also really felt seen with the speed in which I stopped being angry. <laughs> Cause I think Aries are known for having like a quick temper, but I feel that about every emotion. I'm quick to every emotion and then I'm quick to get over it. Pettiness level, revenge level, grudge holding level is a zero. And that's definitely something I could work on or at least not impacting other people with my strong emotions. So maybe that's something we will explore as I read on with the rest of this and find another book that I just want to read. Maybe it'll be something related to my moon sign or my rising sign. So if you're a channel member, I'll see you over there. Everybody else, thank you so much for being here for this chaotic vlog that didn't go as I always dreamed. But I will see you soon with another vlog with hopefully just a plethora of five stars. Bye.